Hello, and welcome to the third and final video covering the topic, topics of chapter four. This third video is going to get into, in many ways, the main content of the chapter because we're going to discuss the, um, the material that is mentioned in the title of the chapter, the birth of the solar system. The previous two videos were background information, more review of physics, and a explanation of or a summary of the solar system. What are the planets? What are the common features of the solar system? Okay, but let's get into the story about how the solar system was formed and how we find out how old it is. Okay, so looking at section 4.2, the birth of the solar system. Our goals for learning here are to find out how did we arrive at a theory of solar system formation and where did the solar system come from? So kind of understanding again, the process of science and then getting into a few of the details. All right, so how did we arrive at a theory of solar system formation? Okay, so we have four major features that need to be explained, right? So that's a good theory needs to cover the major features. We have several, several reasonable hypotheses that were explored, that were proposed. One was the idea of the nebular hypothesis and the other was the close encounter hypothesis. There are others, but these are the two that we're gonna compare for the sake of argument, okay? So, what are the four major characteristics of the solar system that any reasonable theory must explain? Well, number one, patterns of motion of the large bodies. We have to explain why all the orbits are in the same direction and when they basically are in a plane. Why don't we have planets orbiting in a more spherical structure? You know, why don't some planets orbit in, you know, on, the, on kind of a vertical circle and some in a horizontal circle? Why do they all orbit on the same plane? And even better, why do they all orbit in the same direction? How, do we, how would we get a process like that? All right, number two, we have to explain the existence of two types of planets. Why are there some planets that are rocky and have metals and other dense materials, and, and then the Jovian planets that are mostly gas and much bigger? All right, next one, why are there smaller bodies? Why is, there, why is our solar system populated by millions of asteroids and even more tens of millions of comets on the outer edges of the solar system? Okay, and then finally, the last major aspect of the solar system that needs to be explained are the exceptions because they're a strange phenomenon. For example, the rotation of Uranus, 90 degrees tilt, tilted from all other planets, Earth's large moon, and some others. Okay, so let's consider the first of our two competing theories, the nebular theory. The nebular theory states that our solar system formed from the gravitational collapse of a giant interstellar gas cloud, the solar nebula. Okay, so everything, including the sun, would have been formed from this collapsing cloud. Nebula is a Latin word for cloud, by the way, hence the term nebular or nebula, okay? Kant and Laplace, these are um, former scientists, proposed the nebular hypothesis over two centuries ago. A larger out amount of evidence now supports this idea, okay? So what is the competing hypothesis, the close encounter hypothesis? A rival idea proposed that the planets formed from debris torn off the sun by a close encounter with another star. That hypothesis could not explain the observed motions and types of planets. Okay, now it, it maybe made sense. The star was already there. Maybe stars come from somewhere else other than nebula. And then when our star passed by another star, the gravitational pull of that other star, you know, sheared off a lot of the upper layers of the sun. And then those, all that leftover matter formed the planets, you know, the gas planets, the terrestrial planets. But there's a lot, there's a lot of issues with this theory, okay? Now, maybe the popularity of this theory was the idea that, that the timeline would be faster and it wouldn't, it wouldn't require the explanation of this nebula slowly forming a star. But we now know that of the two theories, this is the correct one, the nebula theory by far, especially with the large body of evidence that we now have in modern astronomy of other solar systems. But 200 years ago, when these two theories were first being proposed and competing with one another, they both seemed reasonable, all right? But let's then again, con, you know, kind of continue with the idea about how the nebula theory is supported by these four major observations of our solar system, the information that we now have as modern astronomers about other solar systems notwithstanding. okay? So where did the solar system come from, all right? Well, this is a nebula, okay? So this is, this is modern astronomy. This is us looking at nebula through, say, the Hubble telescope, right? So a modern, sophisticated telescope. And seeing within, within this giant nebula, there are pockets of collapsing gas that are forming protostars, young stars. And look at this. Around the young stars are disks, 
and we think those disks will form planets over millions and billions of years, hundreds of millions or a few billion years. All right, so these are, so, these are stars and solar systems forming. And the processes seem to go together. As the star starts to form and starts to undergo fusion, and as we talk more about the, the, the processes of stars, the birth of stars, we'll get into more, more of those details in future chapters. But as that star starts to undergo fusion, meanwhile, the leftover ring of matter around the star starts to form planets. Right? So these things happen. Or sometimes two stars are formed and you have a binary star system. But formation of stars, formation of planets all come from a common origin of a collapsing giant cloud known as a stellar nebula. All right. So how does this work? Well, there's, a pro there's an idea called galactic recycling. And uh, this is another idea we'll revisit when we talk about how galaxies um, basically contribute or allow for galactic recycle um, to happen. You know, what, what does it really mean on a galactic level? But as a brief introduction, let's look at this circular process. Okay, so you can think of this as a cycle. All right, so let's start over here with a, um, about with a, the star is being born, because we were just discussing that. So stars are born in clouds of gas and dust. The, the, the gas starts to collapse, everything becomes more dense, the star begins to shine bright because fusion has begun in its core. All right. Now, inside of that star, during its hundreds of millions, billions, tens of billions of life, lifespan, depending on what type of star it is, it, start, it produces heavier elements from lighter ones. The very process that makes it shine bright produces heavier elements. It turns the lightest elements like hydrogen and helium into heavier elements, oxygen, carbon, iron, okay? When the star dies and blows up, that heavy material is returned to space. So then in the next stellar nebula, there's heavier material. Some of that heavier material in the disk surrounding the star can form planets, thus explaining the existence of heavy material on a planet like ours. The fact that we can dig into the surface of our planet and find gold deposits because those heavy materials were made in previous generation stars that then were spread across the galaxy and left over to form a planet like ours, all right? So elements that formed planets were made in stars and then recycled through interstellar space. Okay, so there's been many generations of stars before our own solar system. Okay, so the evidence from other gas clouds. We can see stars forming in other interstellar gas clouds lending support to the nebula theory. Okay, okay so what have we learned here, right? We've learned that the four major features of the, of the solar system are explained by the nebula theory and that we actually see nebulas that seem to have the, the characteristics that, that our early solar system must have had some three and a half billion years ago. And of course, I'll later get to how we know it's three and a half billion years in a bit, okay? All right, so let's get into more detail explaining those major features because we just kind of touched on them. Let's ex explicitly explain why we think the planets are all in one plane. Why do they all orbit in one direction? Why do we have two different types, terrestrial and Jovian? Why do we have comets and asteroids? And what about the exceptions? Okay, because those are the big four. Okay? So, what caused the orderly pa patterns of motion in our solar system? All right? So here's a figure from, from your textbook. Okay? So, the idea actually comes down to conservation of angular momentum. That same principle that I've touched on twice, right, at the end of chapter three and the beginning of chapter four, that is usually illustrated with the idea of the ice skater that when she pulls in her arms, she spins more quickly because of conservation of angular momentum. Her reduced um, rotational inertia means an increase in rotational velocity, okay? But how does angular momentum explain the fact that all the planets are moving in the same direction and all in one plane? Well, let's get into it. So rotation speed of the cloud from which our solar system formed must have increased, increased as the cloud contracted, okay? So this is the idea that as the cloud becomes smaller, right? See the arrows coming in? It has to spin faster and faster. So notice the initial rotation arrows are rather short, but as the, the cloud has collapsed significantly, the rotation, rotation arrows are much bigger. So the rotation of the contracting cloud speeds up for the same reason a skater speeds up as she pulls in her arms, okay? Just like we saw in the figure with the, the female ice skater. Okay, so that makes sense, but why a, why a disc, okay? Well, Here's the best explanation. It ends up being an explanation that's rather complicated and, and math mathematically subtle, but we can kind of touch on it. So the idea is that the flattening, okay, from a basically a three-dimensional cloud, right, you know, like a cloud you see in the sky, which is very much, you know, thick and wide, is not flat, right? But the flattening of our solar system until eventually basically a disk like this, 
occurred because collisions between particles in the cloud caused it to flatten. So the idea is that all those collisions are happening. Every time they happen, there's going to be one direction that is favored because there was initially more motion in a single direction. And so then that, and essentially in the spinning direction. So whatever direction that the cloud starts to spin in, as particles collide, the ones that collide and then bounce off in the direction of the spinning are less likely to make more collisions and thus continue to have velocity, okay? And so that, that's how a spherical cloud becomes a fast spinning disk over hundreds of millions of years, okay? So the collision between gas particles and the cloud gradually reduced random motion. Because again, random motion was when it was spherical, going in every direction. The collisions between the gas particles also reduce up and down motions. Because again, the motion that's most likely to survive, the dominant motion that remains after all those trillions upon trillions of individual collisions, initially between very small molecules, eventually between larger rocks that have formed, okay? Well, they, they tend to go in the same direction, all right? So the spinning cloud flattens as it shrinks. So they, the, very, the very conservation momentum process that says that the cloud must spin faster as it shrinks also says it flattens. That's probably the best way to kind of understand the basic idea. Okay, do we see disks around other stars? Yes, observations of disks around other stars support this idea, right? So, because it's, it's incredibly complex, right? You could come up with a complete, competing mathematical model to explain something that involves, you know, all these collisions, this statistical argument, but we see that it does appear to actually exist elsewhere in the galaxy. That's really lending some concrete evidence to the theory, okay? So, for example, here is a photo of a disk around another star. This is not looking back in time at our early solar system, but this is looking back at a solar system that, we, that is currently in its early stages and showing what ours probably looked like billions of years ago. The gaps in this protoplanetary disk, that's the term given to these early solar systems where the planets aren't formed yet, as imaged by ALMA are likely due to forming planets. So essentially each of these bands, almost like the bands in the disks of, of Saturn, right, um, are going to eventually form planets because the matter is concentrating there. It will continue to concentrate until particularly big chunks will start to crash into all the smaller chunks, thus just getting bigger in the process until there's only one big chunk left, which then eventually will collapse into a sphere under the influence of gravity if it's big enough, okay? All right, so, but that's the first one, the idea that the solar system is disk-like. But what about the two major types of planets? You know, why, why should we expect there to be rocky planets near the star and gassy planets further away, okay? Well, just quick summary, right? And this is all stuff that we saw before. Terrestrial planets, small in mass, um, small in mass and size, close to the sun, made of metal and rock, few moons and wrists, no rings. Jovian planets, large mass and size, far from the sun, made of helium and hydrogen, so much simpler composition, and rings and mini moons, right? Those are the key things that separate terrestrial and jovial planets because they are quite different, okay? Well, it's all about temperature all about temperature. And this makes sense because the sun would have already been hot early in the protoplanetary disk phase of the history of our solar system. And that would have dominated what kinds of planets could form where. And this idea, this dividing line between the two types of planets, the demarcation between the terrestrial rocky planets and the Jovian gassy planets is something called the frost line, right? Kind of a cool name. All right, so inside the frost line, it is too hot for hydrogen compounds to form into ices. So when I mean by hydrogen compounds, I think, mean things like H2O, I think I mean things like ammonia, I mean things like methane, okay? Hydrogen compounds. Well, around, at the, in space around Earth, the temperature is high enough that because we're closer to the sun and the radiant energy is greater, that those types of elements would be in a gas form. They wouldn't be in a solid form. And that's key because if they're, a ga if they're in a gas form, they're less likely to stick together and form a planet. They just kind of get bounced around. They may eventually end up in an atmosphere or terrestrial planet, but they won't be part of that original formation process. On the, um, on, the other on the other hand, outside of the frost line, you do have ices that form from hydrogen compounds. So all those same elements over here form solid chunks. The solid chunks can crash together and make bigger chunks. Excuse me. Inside the frost line, all of those very common elements, right? Hydrogen, the most common element in the universe, are in a gas form and don't readily stick together, right? When was, when was the last time you saw two, you know, you know, 
bits of gas clouds kind of just like conglom together, right? That doesn't happen. But you get two pieces of mud and you stick them together, they stay stuck, right? That's the idea. Or even snow, right? You can stick snow together and make a bigger snowball. You can't stick air together and make a bigger air ball, right? That's the idea. That's, how, that's why gas isn't good at forming planets, okay? But ice is, okay? So then we have the ice forming planets outside the frost line. Okay, so let's elaborate on this so we make sure I understand not just the idea that there's a frost line and one place where the hydrogen compounds are solid and one place where they're not, but exactly how that leads to the two types, the Jovian and the terrestrial. Okay, so small particles of rock and metal were present inside the frost line. They were also present outside the frost line. Okay, so it's the metal would have been distributed evenly throughout the solar system. One, one idea and a common misconception that I really want to make sure you don't have is it's not like the denser materials, all the metals of the solar system sunk towards the sun. That's simply not the way it works. That would only work if the solar system was at rest. The fact that all the planets are in motion means that denser material is spread evenly throughout the proto protoplanetary disk and thus evenly throughout the solar system. So actually there's just as much iron, just as much platinum, just as much gold and uranium, all the densest, material, densest elements, densest materials in the universe in Jupiter as there is in Earth. It's just that they're encased in a giant cloud of hy you know, hydrogen and helium and so forth, right? So it's, those heavy elements exist in the gas giants, but we can't see them because the gas giants are mostly gas, right? They, in that case, they have sunk to the bottom because the planet itself is at rest, okay? So planetismals of rock and metal built up as these particles collided, okay? And that would be inside the frost line and outside the frost line. Gravity eventually assembled these planetes planetismals, as they're called, into terrestrial planets. This, pl this process is called accretion. That's that glomming together of matter until eventually you get one big chunk that all the smaller chunks stick, that stick to, okay? All right, total gravitational process, but also kind of consistent again with the snowball analogy, okay? But this would be a dirt ball, all right? So that's the terrestrial planets forming, okay? So this is a picture just showing the kind of an illustration of the accretion of plant planetismals, right? Lots of individual particles re uh, initially forming into bigger and bigger ones and eventually just into a few biggest ones, which we call planets. Okay, so many smaller objects collected into just a few large ones. All right, but what about outside the frost line? So ice could also form small particles outside the frost line. And here's the key idea. There is much more ice than rock anywhere in the solar system, right? Well, there would be inside the frost line, but it turns to gas. But there, I suppose there's much more ice than rock outside the frost line, okay? There's not more ice and rock inside the frost line because that ice is gas. That element is still very abundant, but it's gas, all right? So the ice could also form small pl uh, plant particles outside the frost line. The large planetismals and planets were able to form, the larger ones, okay? They would have had all the same he heavier elements like the, the, the things that were forming inside the frost line, but they would have been encased essentially or interspersed with lots of ice. So everything grew on a bigger scale outside the frost line because there's just more to work with. The gravity of these larger planets was able to draw in surrounding hydrogen and helium gases. Because it turns out that pure, like atomic hydrogen gas and pure helium gas, they, they freeze at such low temperatures that they remain gaseous even outside the frost line. It's the hydrogen compounds that form the ices. But here's the key idea. Since there was so much more ice than rock outside the frost line, and things were able to grow so much faster and get so much bigger, that those giant planets that formed outside the frost line were so gravitational, they were so big that they're able to draw in gas in a way that terrestrial planets really weren't able to. Now terrestrial planets do draw in some gas, we do have an atmosphere after all, but it's minuscule compared to the gas that say Jupiter has drawn in or Saturn or any of the gas giants, the Jovian planets. All right, so what about the moons of the Jovian planets, right? right? Well, they formed as their own miniature disks. Because again, these Jovian planets were so large that their gravity acted like little mini systems, okay? The terrestrial planets just don't have lots of moons because they're just not big enough to create a large, large enough gravitational impact, all right? So how do the Jovian planets form? A combination of photons in the solar wind, outflowing matter from the sun, blew away the leftover gases. So eventually, we, the leftover gases were dispersed. Okay, and this is actually a really important idea when we talk about other solar systems because it turns out that not all solar systems have that aspect. We see a lot of solar systems where the leftover gas kind of stayed leftover and that, that seems to have 
could have the potential of significant effects on the orbits of planets like Jupiter, eventually causing those planets to circle inwards and, become an, and end up in orbits closer to Mercury's orbit. They're called hot Jupiters, and they're totally bizarre because they're unlike anything we see in our solar system, but they seem to be very common in other solar systems. And it's probably because there was so much leftover gas that a sort of a friction process could occur. But that's something we'll talk about later. All right, so what about solar rotation? So in the nebula theory, the young sun rotated much faster than now. Had a lot of left, all that leftover energy and that conservation of angular momentum. It, it was able to slow down over time because it was able to let go of energy through radiating that energy away as light. All right. Also, friction between the solar magnetic fields and the solar nebula probably slowed the rotation over time. Because the, the, the sun has a huge magnetic field. That magne magnetic field would interact with matter within the nebula, within the protoplanetary protoplanetary disk and eventually with the magnetic fields of the planets and that creates a kind of a, a back it's almost like a motor that has a back emf have you ever heard of that heard of that idea but it's a, it would be a, sl a gradual slowing force to the sun because today our sun is still spinning quickly but no way nowhere as quickly as we theorize it used to spin billions of years ago all right number three where did the asteroids and comets come from right so so far we've explained the idea of these this accretion this process of big planets forming because they they crash into everything in their way and everything sticks to them or they draw, draw every in, everything in through gravity. But in that case, why are there some leftovers, right? What, what allows for that? Well, leftovers from the accretion process, rocky asteroids inside the frost line, icy comets outside the frost line. Why rocky? Well, because only rocks are inside the frost line. Why icy outside? Because the icy comets are dirty mud balls. They still have the rock inside, but they're encased in the more common ice, the abundance of ice. That's why all the comets are icy and all the ast asteroids are rocky. But again, the comets are actually muddy. They have just as much rock as the asteroids. It's just that they have a lot more ice. I want to reiterate that because it's, it's kind of, it's really easy to miss that idea. Okay? So that's just a, this is just a vision that is totally consistent with the idea of Jovian planets and terrestrial planets. Inside the frost line versus outside the frost line. Okay? Rocky, icy. Okay? But again, why, why are there leftovers in the first place? Okay? Well, Inevitably, there's some leftovers, and we think there used to be a lot more. So even though we still see asteroids today, we're seeing a tiny remnant of what there once was. In fact, all the leftover planetismals bombarded other objects in the late stages of the solar system formation. So once all the planets were basically fully formed, they were spherical, approximately as big as they are today, they were being bombarded by tons of leftover asteroids and comets. And we see this when we look at the surface of planets that hasn't changed much since those early ages. We see them just covered in potholes, covered in these these big collision mark, collision impacts, right? These huge, huge craters, all right? We don't see that on Earth because Earth has constantly refreshed its surface through plate tectonics, all right? So water may have also come to Earth through those icy planetismals. It's, it's theorized that all of the, or at least 90% of the liquid water on Earth's sur surface came from early comet collisions. All that ice melted and left us with oceans. But what about exceptions, right? How do we, how do we have exceptions to the rules? Well, we think that most exceptions are explained by particularly big collisions during that phase of bombardment. All right. So what about other exceptions? Captured moons. Maybe some of those asteroids didn't crash into planets, but instead got captured and became moons. Sort of like a gravitational pull, like jumping onto a merry-go-round merry and staying on it rather than just crashing into the side of it. All right. How do we explain the existence of our moon? Giant impact, right? A huge, almost like... Pluto-sized planetismal crashed into Earth, throwing off a huge amount of matter that then c condensed into its own spherical shape, forming our very large and relatively close moon. What about the tipped-over planet Uranus? Same idea. Giant impact actually knocked it over, which would also help explain the extra cool surface of, your, uh, of the planet Uranus, because it would have lost a lot of energy during that impact. All right, so thought question. How would the solar system be different in the solar neb if the solar nebula had cooled with a temperature half its actual value? Right, so what would, what would be different? Think about the frost line. The Jovian planets would have formed closer. That frost line would still be there, but it'd be much closer to, sun, to the sun, probably inward of our own orbit. All right? So was the solar system destined to be? Is all, this, all these ideas saying that we could you know, model the solar system? Is it an absolute deterministic process? Well, the formation of the planets in the solar, solar nebula seem inevitable. It seems like the, the, the physical processes of the flattening of the disk, of accretion, of certain types of planets forming in certain places does seem like an inevitable process. But there are individual details, unlikely events, that can happen when things line up or occur just right 
that do happen, that create strange phenomena. And you think that these, these naturally processes, these arguments of averages happening over billions of years, inevitably do leave open the window of chance events. Because sure, you can repeat something over and over again. Like think about flipping, flipping a penny. You flip a penny a billion times, you're probably gonna get a thousand heads in a row at some point. No matter how unlikely that is, the unlikely things will happen if you have enough events occur. So which of these facts is not explained by the nebula theory? Look at the list, pause the video if you need to. Okay, you have a choice. The number of planets of each type, right? There is no predetermined number. There just had to be some terrestrial planets, it could have just been one, for example, and there had to be some Jovian planets because there was matter in both sections. All right, so summary of the information. I'll let you read this on your own so we can move on. Let's talk about the age of the solar system. It's our last topic here. How do we know, know how old the solar system is, right? How do we measure the age of a rock? And then how do we know that those rocks tell us something about the age of the solar system? So there's two related questions. We have to answer the first one first before we can answer the second one second. All right, so we know how to measure the age of the rock with something called atomic decay and the fact that that atomic decay occurs in half-lives. So what's going on, right? Well, some isotopes decay into other nuclei. There's the idea that there's certain types of naturally occurring elements that are unstable and will change into other elements over time. If you've ever heard of radioactive waste from a nuclear power plant, all of those radioactive waste products are unstable and will decay. Some of them have decay that just takes seconds, others have decay that takes billions of years, but those atoms are fundamentally unstable. Whereas like a, a carbon, like a carbon atom isn't, right? Well, it depends on the type of carbon because not to, not to do a crash course in the periodic table, but every element has isotopes. Isotopes are just a variation in the number of neutrons in the nucleus of the atom. And certain combinations of neutrons with a certain number of protons are stable. Other combinations of neutrons and protons are unstable. It's the unstable ones that decay. Okay. For example, potassium 40. Okay, potassium shows up in bananas. Most types of potassium are stable, but this particular type of potassium is unstable. The 40 refers to the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, okay? And thus telling us how many neutrons there are by subtracting the atomic number from 40. Likewise, argon 40 is not unstable, but is the product of decaying potassium 40. So this particular rare isotope of potassium decays into argon-40. And when I say rare, I mean that in a population of potassium, right? Again, you know, common you know, nutrient in bananas and other food, most of it is not potassium-40, but a small subsection of it is. That small amount of potassium that is potassium-40 decays into argon-40, all right? And it does it with a half-life of 1.25 billion years, all right? What does that mean? That means that half the original population, one is just the fraction of population, after 1.25 billion years has become argon. That's the idea of the half-life. After that length of time, because half-life is a time, half the population has changed into the product of the decay. All right, so a half-life is a time for half the nuclei in a substance to decay, okay? So after two half-lives, which would just be 1.25 times two, or 2.5 billion years, now half of the half has decayed into argon-40. Well, okay, so if your original population was one and you lost half in the first 1.25 billion years, and then you lost half of the remaining half in the next 1.25 billion years, that, that says that after 2.5 billion years or two half-lives, you would have 25% of your original population. Because all you did is you divided by two twice. If you divide by two twice, you get a quarter. A quarter is 0.25. After three half-lives, of three point, uh, here being 3.75 billion years, how much, you would how much would you have left? Well, it's a quarter divided by two, an eighth. And an eighth in decimal form is 0.125. That means that 12.5%, right? Because to get a percent, I just multiply by 100. 12.5% of the original population of potassium-40 remains. The other, um, well, See, uh, what would be, it'd be 12 point, whatever 100 minus 12.5 is, the other remaining percent has become argon-40, all right? Now, do all unstable nuclei have half-lives of 1.25 billion years? No, but we know what the different elements are and their half-lives. We're able in the laboratory to determine them. Thus, we have a mechanism for dating things, all right? So 
Here's a quick check. Make sure you understand this one. It's okay if you don't have first pass. Suppose you find a rock originally made of potassium-40, half of which decays into argon-40. Okay, just like the graph. Every 1.25 billion years. You open the rock and find 15 atoms of argon-40 for every atom of potassium-40. How long ago did the rock form? Try this one out, okay? If you're stuck, here's my answer. Five billion years, okay? Because that's four half-lives, okay? All right, and I, I won't explain it more. I want you to make sense of it, but you can ask me if you're stuck on the idea. All right, you know, and there's more of these in the homework. So how do we know the age of the solar system? Radiometric dating, that's the idea of just measuring how much there is of, of certain unstable um, elements or isotopes. A radio, radiometric dating tells us the oldest moon rocks are 4.4 billion years old. The oldest meteorites are 4.55 billion years old. That means that planets probably formed four and a half billion years ago. All right, I think I misspoke a minute ago and said three and a half but it's four and a half billion years is the age of the, system, age of the solar system, and we know that because we can radiometrically date rocks, okay? Now, one thing is we have to make sure we radiome radiometric date rocks that weren't reformed because the, the concentration, the mixture of these radioactive elements can get reset if you melt it all together and mix, mix a bunch of rocks together. So we have to find original chunks of the solar system, original ancient asteroids in order to date the solar system. Right? If we dated a rock from Earth and found that that rock was a billion years old, that doesn't mean that solar system is a billion years old. It just means that particular rock was melted and reformed a billion years ago. Okay? So we have to find original rocks, not the type that have been involved in volcanic or tectonic activity on the surface of a planet. All right, well, that is it for this lecture, the final one for chapter four. I know it's been a big, big chapter with a lot of material, but that's why I spread it over two weeks. I hope it's been interesting, and I look forward to any questions and talking with you throughout the semester. Thank you so much for watching.